decided to come back and be with us again this Sunday. I'm still basking from last Sunday. Didn't our hearts burn as we worshiped and fellowshiped together out there on the yard? That was amazing, yes. Well, today is March and that means something. Well, every year by presidential proclamation, March is designated Women History Month. The month is set aside to honor the contributions and the achievements of women throughout American history and the contributions and achievements of today's sheroes. Sheroes like Stacey Abrams, whose efforts turned a red state into a blue state. Sheroes like Kamala Harris, our first female African-American vice president. Sheroes like Kizzy Corbett, you know Kizzy, she was one of the key scientists, key scientists behind the COVID-19 vaccine. But there are so many others, engineers and teachers and lawyers and judges and doctors and lovers and friends and caretakers and babysitters and sisters and TTs and mothers. We are the women that the world is honoring. And all month here at Greater Grant, we will feature a woman of God that will bring our morning message. Today, our very own Reverend Regina Mangrum will be our preacher. Do this for me. Find a woman or two, someone that had a major impact in your life and whisper in her ear, I love you. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. That would mean so much to her. Now, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Let's go worship. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Holy and most gracious Father, we come before your throne of grace today with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts. Father God, we thank you for allowing us to step into a new day. Father God, we thank you 
as you have allowed us to come together today to celebrate women. Celebrate strong women of faith, who faith does not waver and it does not shrink. Father God, we thank you for the strong women of the ages. We thank you for the Queen Esthers. We thank you for the Sarahs. We thank you for the Lydias. Father God, we thank you as you bless us today. Thank you for those women that stand behind the sacred desk and preach the word of God in the pulpits in this nation and around this world. Father God, they preach the word of God, and we thank you. We thank you for the many blessings that you have anointed them with. Father God, we thank you for the first ladies that stand in the churches beside their husbands, and you have given them a special blessing to help their husbands in the ministry that you have charged them with. And Father God, we just want to again say thank you, and we thank you for all of those blessings. Father God, we just want to thank you for the mothers, for the mothers that have rocked the babies in the cradle, and they have taught these babies that Jesus lives, Jesus loves us, this we know, for the Bible tells us so. Father God, we thank you for that special mother of all mothers. We thank you for Mary, the mother of Jesus, who rocked our Savior in the cradle, and he is our Savior and our deliverer. Father God, we thank you for Mary Magdalene, the one that you sent to let everyone know that you have risen. You have, you could have told anybody, all the disciples, that you had risen from the dead, but you told a woman. And Father God, that's why we come today to celebrate women. And we want to thank you for the anointing that you have given to all the women in the church in the various capacities that they serve in. And you have given us special anointings. And we ask you to continue to anoint us with fresh oil. Now, Father God, we pray for those that are sick and those that are afflicted. We pray for those that have infirmities in their bodies. We especially send up prayers for those that suffer from the coronavirus. Lord, many are ailing there in hospitals, and we just pray for them, Lord. We pray for those families that have had family members to succumb to this hideous disease. But we know, Lord, that you will give them peace peace that surpasses all understanding. You said that you would keep us in perfect peace if we keep our minds stayed on you. And Lord, let us not look to the left nor the right, but keep looking to the hills from which cometh our help. Father God, now those that are struggling, who haven't made the decision whether they want to take the, the vaccine or not, we ask that they pray and seek your face, Lord, and help them to decide the right way to go Father God, and we just want to thank you and, and deliver them from any type of uh, unconcern they have and anything that they're afraid of and let them know that it is put here and that prayer and medicine work together. Now, Father God, we thank you for our pastor who leads us in this great church and let us continue to be a beacon in our community and we forever give you the honor the praise and the glory. In the precious name of the risen Savior, Jesus the Christ, amen, amen, and amen. The scripture lesson for this morning is coming from John chapter 20, verses 14 through 18, being read from the Contemporary English Version Bible. Thus saith the Lord. As soon as Mary said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there but she did not know who he was. Jesus asked her, Why are you crying? Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener and said, Sir, if you have taken his body away, please tell me so I can go and get him. Then Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni. The Aramaic word Rabboni means teacher. Jesus told her, Don't hold on to me. I have not yet gone to the Father. But tell my disciples, I am going to the one who is my father and my God, as well as your father and your God. Mary Magdalene then went and told the disciples she had seen the Lord. She had also told them what he had said to her. The word of God 
for the people of God. to Georgia. Ben and I decided that we might separate, and so I came home. But the Lord had already warned me not to go back to Valdosta, but I wouldn't listen. I went home anyway. When I got there, I found all kind of obstacles blocking my way. 
And in the back of my head, the Lord said, go back to Virginia. But I still wasn't listening. I stayed through February. I stayed through March. April, May, and June. Finally, at the end of the year in 1983, I yielded to the Lord in the will that he had for me. I got on a bus and I went back to Arlington, Virginia. Didn't know where I was going, but I knew the Lord was leading me. When I got there, the first job I went on, the lady said, okay, you can start tomorrow. And she called me the next day and she said, oh no, you don't have a master's. So she told me, we hired somebody who was a psychologist with a master's degree. My reply was, because she has a master's degree does not mean that she's a good teacher. Well, she called me the next day because that lady didn't show up who took the job, but God had something better for me. That's when I learned to start walking in the faith. At first, I thought I was. I thought I was doing the right thing, but I wasn't because I hadn't yielded to God. God told me, you trusted me, and you keep faith, and I'll show you what I can do for you. Well, I had a friend who taught school over in Arlington, and she called me. She said, I hear you're back in Virginia. And I said, yeah. She said, well, guess what? I got a job interview for you. I said, okay, I'm coming. I went over there. I interviewed with the director of the center there. It was Marie H. Reed Learning Center in Adams Morgan. Didn't know the, the connection between Marie Reed at the time and my faith in, in God and the AME Church. But guess what, y'all? God blessed me. He gave me a job. And it was a good paying job. More than I ever even expected because I had faith and trusted in him. And the years have come and the years have gone by, but because my faith in God, knowing that even when things aren't good, when things aren't looking good, God is still working it out for me. So I walk in my faith. And this isn't a journey that you just start growing. You grow every day. From day one to the end of the time that you leave here, you grow and you walk in that faith. And believe me, as long as you're walking in faith, as long as you're yielding to the will of God, I guarantee you that God will take care of you and he will not let your faith shrink. Thank you, Lord, for all your many wonderful blessings. I thank you.
Good morning. It is so great to be in worship again. We can't be with each other physically, but in our virtual spaces, we can lift up the name of the Lord. We can praise Him. We can thank Him for all of our blessings. We are celebrating Women's History Month. We're going to talk about some women, some great women. Our theme is when women witness celebrating a faith that will not shrink. I want to come to you today and talk about a woman who we find her name is listed in Hebrews uh, the 11th chapter the 31st verse. And it says, by faith Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. What are you doing with your faith today? Let us pray. God, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity to speak your word. Now I ask you, Lord, to anoint all of us for the hearing of your word, to open our hearts to the revelation of your word to help us to do your word and I ask you now Lord that you would anoint me for the preaching in Jesus name we pray amen hallelujah during the last several weeks in Bible discovery hour we have talked about some phenomenal women women who were called to fulfill a particular purpose they were equipped by God and strategically placed to accomplish what he called them to do. The work they were called to was not always easy. Many times it required them to operate outside of accepted roles. You know, when people say, you are a woman, you are too poor, you are uneducated, you are black, you have no authority, you are too old. As we studied these women of the Bible, we were given a contemporary woman to consider. Women who accomplished much in the face of opposition, who had overcome what others thought of them, that they did not have what it takes to accomplish their mission. Women who risked their lives and the safety Women who persisted nonetheless. Women like Fannie Lou Hamer, who was bit beaten and told no over and over again. Yet, she continued to fight with dignity for the voting rights of black folk. Or the preacher, Jarena Lee, who refused to back down when she was told that she could not have a pulpit. She could not be a pastor because she was a woman. She did not let that stop her. She continued to preach at every opportunity. She traveled hundreds of miles a year, preaching the gospel wherever she could. Courage seems to be the word that connects these women for me. It takes courage to step away from what is familiar to trust what can be. It takes courage, and that is a word that I believe describes a woman in our text today. Her courage came from faith. Our text today simply says, by faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. The Message Bible puts it this way. By an act of faith, Rahab, the Jericho harlot, welcomed the spies. And because of this, she escaped the destruction that came on those who refused to trust God. She trusted God, and it was an act of faith. Who is this woman? What is her story? The complete story of what she did is mostly found in Joshua, in the second uh, chapter of Joshua. I would suggest
suggest that you take some time and read that second chapter of Joshua. In addition to being named in the book of Joshua, the writer of Hebrews includes her in the Faith Hall of Fame, along with other heroes of faith, like Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Moses, David. Rahab was right there with the rest. She is so important to God's story for mankind that you can find things about her seven other times in the Bible. So the people of Israel are encamped on the other side of the Jordan River. They are ready to possess the land that God promised them. Joshua sends two spies into Jericho. They go to the house of Rahab. She finds out who they are and she hides them. Some men are sent from the king of Jericho to Rahab's house. They are looking for these two spies. But all the while she's talking to the, to the king's men, the spies have been hidden on her roof. She tells the men that uh, she doesn't know where the men, the two spies, have gone. But she points them into a direction and she says, if you go this way, you will overtake them and you will find them. After she has uh, told this information to the uh, Jericho's kings, she goes up to the roof and, and she tells the, the spies who she's hidden. She makes a, a plan and she makes an agreement with them. They take an oath and tell her that because she has helped them, when they come back, they will save her and they tell her how they want her to go about it. She has helped them let down, let down a, a cord from her window to help them escape. So they say to her, use this cord so that your house will be identified when they return. She has told the men before that, that I know about your God. He is ruler in heaven and earth. If you will save me and my family, then I will help you. This city of Jericho was ideally situated on a very fertile plain, surrounded by mountains, the Jordan River, and the Mediterranean Sea. It was a crossroads, the center of commerce and culture. The vegetation was lush, crops plentiful. This was the very land flowing with milk and honey that God had promised his people 40 long years ago. So here they are now, 40 years later, the descendants of that disbelieving generation they are trusting Joshua, and they are ready to go into battle for this land that God has promised them. So, Rahab is situated in the right place at the right time. She was used by God for a specific purpose at this appointed time. Situated physically and spiritually, mind and body in the right place to be used by God. Jericho was a well-fortified city with two thick walls, an outer wall and an inner wall. And it was not unusual for people to build houses between those two walls. Timbers were used to connect the house and anchor the house to the two walls. She lived in such a home. Her house was situated in the wall near the gate. The stage is set for the mission to be accomplished. Yes, you heard me when I said what the Bible says, that she was a prostitute. This is proof that God can use any one of us for his purposes. We need not sit in judgment. 
We are in need of his forgiveness, his mercy, and his extravagant grace that covers us all. Rahab was appointed the one to accomplish this mission for God as he fulfilled his promise to his people. I have always been impressed by Rahab, fascinated by her story. She comes to belief because she has heard about God. She comes to believe in this unseen God. And secondly, her devotion for her family. She did not want to leave them behind. Women have big hearts. I'm not saying that men don't have big hearts too. But generally, women have big hearts. They care about a lot of people. They carry a lot of people in their hearts. And they, are, they feel responsible for their well-being. Sometimes they have to carry a whole race of people. Our forefathers who lived in slavery and our foremothers, those women in slavery, they carried a whole nation of us. They cared what happened. They nurtured us through that very dark time of slavery. I am reminded of uh, the woman who, who took so many people to freedom. She was able to free herself, but that woman's heart of hers could not rest until she had gone back to get as many people as she could, and she brought them to freedom. I think about Stacey Abrams. With all of her dignity, she works hard. She wants an entire people to be able to live in freedom to be able to determine how their lives are governed by voting. And so she works to bring a whole group of people along with her. A woman's heart is a selfless heart. Rahab's faith, I believe, manifests itself in three ways. The first is a spoken faith. Rahab makes a statement. I know that the Lord has given you the land, she says to these men. Not I think or maybe, but I know because of this, all of the people around here are afraid of them. The inhabitants of the land, she says, that they melt away from this fear. She said, but we have heard how your God dried up the Red Sea before you as you came out of Egypt. How he destroyed two kings of the Amorites for you. We are in fear, she was saying. Not because of what you did, but because of what the Lord did for you. This is how she speaks to those two men on her roof that she has hidden. The fear of the Lord, the Bible says, is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Proverbs 9 and 10. She ends by saying to these two men, For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Yes, she spoke this to the spies. She, she spoke this faith to the, to the spies. This woman who has unshrinking faith in what she has heard. This woman who lives in a land of idols, who live with people who, who worship Baal and Ashtaroth, these goddess, these, this goddess and, and, the, and this god uh, of fertility. But surrounded by all of that, she sees and understands that God is God and that she is going to put herself in his hands. Her house is a place, we talked about what her vocation is. We can't get around that, the Bible says it right there. Her house is a place where people are coming and going. It's near the city gates. She hears lots of things. People are talking about this and that, about the government, the price of grapes, the price of fish, all sorts of things. 
She heard some things. People talked about many things in her hearing. Oh, she's heard gossip, I'm sure. Some things she's heard are true and some things are not. She does not believe everything she hears. But one day, the thing she hears is talk about the one true God who rules heaven and earth, who has delivered a people from bondage, who has led them in many victories over the enemies. She hears many things, but she knows that this thing she hears is truth. She was so convinced she was willing to stake her life on it, willing to place the lies of her family into the hands of this truth. The second way I believe her, her faith has manifested itself is in her actions that come from this unshrinking faith. You remember when she was talking to the two spies, she helped them escape and she needed to keep their secret all in her action of faith. In this act of faith, she had to get her family ready for the day of battle. For the Israelites are coming back to take the city. She doesn't know when, she doesn't know how, but she believes that they are coming back. And she believes that her, her safety and her family's safety is in their hands. The Bible does not tell us what she says to her family to get them ready for the time of battle. We don't know what she says in this situation. But I believe in my sanctified imagination, it's okay, I, I, I can have that, you can too. I believe that this situation, this preparation that she made with her family could have gone two ways. First, they may have heard about God already. And it may have been easy to share the plan with them. But what if they had not? What if they challenged her? Her brothers, her sisters, her brother-in-laws, her sister-in-laws, her nieces, nephews. The Bible said her entire family would be saved. But what if they challenged her and said, Girl, have you lost your mind? We live in a fortified city with not one wall, but two. These people, these Israelites are, 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 are no, uh, they cannot be compared to us. Our army surely can defeat them. Well, we live in this wonderful place, the, the, this place that where people have enough money, we have enough money, there's food to eat. Because this place was situated in this beautiful open plain by this lush vegetation. The weather is good, girl. Why do we have to do what you are saying? Why must we put ourselves in this danger? However she did it, she got it done. She got them all on board with the plan. It is an amazing thing. Because the more people who know a secret, the more likely it is that that secret will get out. But this secret was safe with all of her family. So she has spoken her faith. She has acted on her faith. Now we're going to see her faith rewarded. So the two spies leave Jericho. They go back to Joshua with this information. They tell Joshua that the woman has helped them and that they promised her her life and the life of her family and all that she owned. So Joshua says, well, you know, I'll agree. We, 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 will, we will make sure that she's safe, that she, that she is taken alive when we go back to take the city. God had promised the land to the people. And Joshua knows that this promise lies behind this challenge. That is why he sent the spies. He was getting the people ready, getting them ready for the battle to take the city. 
God tells Joshua what to do. Guess what? The people won't have to fight. Forty years they wandered. Forty years they, they wandered here and there because they did not believe that the Lord could give them this city, that he would truly stand by them as they fought in the battle against these people that they thought were too strong for them. So in their disbelief, they turned away from this wonderful thing that God had for them. And they wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years. Oh, let us not, church, forego the promises of God because we don't have unshrinking faith. So Joshua tells the people what God told him. Everybody, we're going to walk around the walls of Jericho for six days, one time. On the seventh day, we're going to walk around the city seven times. And when you hear the trumpet of the priest, everyone shout, the city is ours. The people are obedient. They shout. And the Bible says that the, the walls fell flat. Not one wall, but two. Faith rewarded. On this day, when the walls fell, Rahab's house was intact. Yes, she lived in the wall, but it was left standing. And all who belonged to her were saved. On this battlefield that day, around the walls of Jericho, I believe that faith met faith. The faith of Rahab and the faith of the people. You see, when God had taken the people out of Egypt and Pharaoh was on their track and the Red Sea before them, God parted the Red Sea and the people went across on dry land. But this time, when they're getting ready to go into battle and they're preparing themselves on the other side of the Jordan, Joshua tells them, what the Lord has said. When the priest put their feet into the water, the water will go back and we will step on dry land. You see, I think that means that they had to show some faith first before the waters parted. They had to step into that water, not knowing whether or not the water was going to part for them. But they were faithful and they stepped into the water. And all of the people crossed the Jordan into the plains before Jericho, ready to take the city that God had given them. So we have the faith of these people who have crossed Jordan. We have the faith of Rahab, this pagan woman living in this pagan town, only hearing about God, but having faith that she wants to be on the side of the God who rules heaven and earth. So before the walls of Jericho, her faith meets their faith, and they are operating together. I wonder what she must have felt. How would it be to have uh, the walls, all, this, all of this destruction all around you, yet you are standing? Your home is standing. Your family is standing. Not only standing, but standing in victory. Because God has shown her what she believed in. What she, what she believed he could do. Oh, hallelujah. He has done it for her. Thank you, Holy Ghost. A faith that does not shrink keeps us standing in victory. When it seems all is lost. When our times are hard and all around us is one difficult thing after another. How about the year 2020 and COVID-19? How about the joblessness that we see, the homelessness and the hunger? How about the sickness and grief that has surrounded us this past year? In the face of all of that, we are still standing, for we live with hope. We live with the assurance of better things to come. Rahab's a wonderful teacher for us today. God responded to Rahab. He has to. 
He is a man that he should not lie. He promised in his word, and listen to these words of Hebrew 11, in the 11th chapter of Hebrew. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever draws near to God must believe that he exists, that he rewards those who seek him. Rahab is about to get her reward. God keeps his promise. He keeps his word to her. And as the entire city falls, she is saved. She and her family go to live with the Israelites in peace and safety. A faith that speaks. A faith that acts. A faith that is rewarded. The women that we will be discussing, as our theme says, is uh, women who don't have shrinking faith. Women who stand in the face of all challenges, and they keep going. A faith that does not shrink, does not shrink back from opposition or challenge. A faith that will not shrink, tunes out all of the things that are not true, and they allow their lives to be ordered on the promises of God. That's the life of an unshrinking, faithful woman. A faith that does not shrink, looks ahead. It does not focus on the hardships of the day, but imagines a better future. A faith that does not shrink, does not linger long on who they are and what people say they cannot do. Rahab was a prostitute who lived in a, in a house where many things went on. She did not let that stop her from making her stand on the side of God. A faith that does not shrink trusts God for the salvation of the whole family. The woman with this kind of faith never gives up praying for everyone she knows. Her faith does not shrink. She continues to pray that one day she'll see that son or that daughter walk down the aisles of the church and give their life to Christ. One day that colleague will tell her, yes, I'll go to church with you. One day those grandchildren will say, okay, grandma, let's go to church. A faith that does not shrink continues to pray that salvation will come. A faith that does not shrink operates in courage. I believe that courage is going ahead and doing the thing that you fear the most. And when you're operating in faith, you're going to go ahead and do what is the best thing to do. We will have communion Soon we will share communion. Rahab represents to me someone who has been redeemed. Christ died on the cross for us. The God of Israel, the same God who delivered Rahab and gave victory to the Israelite people. It's the same God who sent his son to die for us. The communion table is open. The communion table is open for all of us who are like Rahab. All of us who brings all of our bumps and, and imperfections and our failures, our, our disobedience. We're invited to bring them to the table, to the communion table where God's extravagant grace, his mercy and his love is there for all of us to receive. We must not stop witnessing. And I will say this to all of the mamas and the aunties and the grandmamas. We must not stop witnessing. I believe one of the, the lessons for us about Rahab is that we are responsible for our families. And we do it out of love. We don't do it grudgingly. We do it selflessly. 
Let us not give up on those who we love and who are in our family as they come to faith. God has revealed his word to us this morning. He's given us an example of a woman who heard about him and she answered by placing her life into the truth of who God is. The doors of the church are open. I pray that, you're, that for those of you whose ears were open today, whose heart was open today, and received this message, that you will come to God. He is here. He is waiting for you. He is waiting to help you carry those burdens. He's waiting for you to no longer live in judgment or worry about who you are or who you used to be. Because you come to Him and He will take care of everything that is needed for you to be a part of the kingdom. If you will accept today the hand of the Lord, let us pray this prayer. Lord, I thank you so much that your son died on the, on the cross for me. That your salvation is open to me. I repent, Lord. And at this moment, I ask for your salvation. I ask for your acceptance into the kingdom. Amen. If you have prayed that prayer, you may call the church. Contact uh, the pastor to speak with him. I believe that number is now going on the screen. We bless God and thank him for his word, his word of revelation, his word of strength for our lives. Amen. We will have our stewardship moment now, followed by Holy Communion. Good morning, Greater Grant family and friends. Malachi 3.10 states, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of Heaven's army, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. We are currently in our new normal due to this worldwide pandemic, and we are using innovative ways to continue to build God's kingdom through our giving. Even though we're not physically in the building, the church continues to provide spiritual food for God's saints each week. We are extremely grateful for your generous financial support thus far, and we're asking that you continue to give generously to the uplifting of God's kingdom. Now there are several ways that you can give. Through the mobile app, Give Plus, you can also bring your tithes and offerings to the church on Tuesdays and Thursdays between the hours of 11 a.m. and 12.30 p.m. or mail directly to the church. Again, we thank you for what you have already given and continue to give here at Greater Grand Memorial AME Church. Thank you. When you come to the table today, Remember what I said about it being a place of redemption, uh, a place of healing for you. There's no judgment at the table. Remember that as you take communion today. Let us humbly confess our sins before Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Make of all things and judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our manfold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against your divine majesty, provoking most justly your wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. Have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in the newness of life, to the honor and the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, and the people of God said, Amen.
All glory, power, and honor to you, Almighty God, Holy Father, Creator of heaven and the earth, who did make us in your own image. And when we fell into sin, you of your tender mercy died upon the cross for our redemption, who made thereby his oblation of himself once offered a full and perfect sacrifice for the whole world, and instituted and commanded us to continue this perpetual memorial of his precious death until his coming again. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you shall drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, with this bread and this cup, we remember the life that our Lord offered for us. And believing the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with us the great and the promised feast. Gracious God, you are holy indeed, the fountain of all holiness. Bless and sanctify these gifts with your Holy Spirit and bless us to your service that we may faithfully receive in unity and peace the body and the blood of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. The body of our Lord I eat and give thanks. His precious blood I drink and I give him thanks for his grace and for his mercy. Amen. My brothers and my sisters, if you will now come, take the bread. Eat you all of it. As you eat, give God thanks for his sacrifice on the cross. Now take the cup. Drink you all of it. For this is the blood of our Savior Jesus the Christ. Not the blood of goats nor the blood of rams, but the precious blood that ran from Emmanuel's veins. Drink you all of it that it might preserve your soul and your body unto eternal life. Having received the elements of Holy Communion, give God praise and give God glory for his grace and mercy towards us. Amen. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever Amen. Now, God, as we lead this worship time, even in our virtual spaces this morning, as we lead this time of worship and praise and prayer and, and singing, I ask God that you will go with us that you will cover us always with your peace, with your love, with your grace, 